Matt for promising that we're going to have fun in here. Uh, I think as we've been going through John, last week was the opportunity we had for fun. Last week, Jesus turns water into wine. He is the best friend we'd all want, free, glorious wine. This week, we have Jesus uh, meeting a bunch of people, driving them out of the temple with a whip, uh, basically ruining uh, their jobs and all their lives. Um, but please do turn to that story with me. Uh, it is John 2, uh, verses 13 to 25. Uh, we've been going through John uh, the past few weeks and we will be uh, for a lot more weeks. Uh, and we'll read it together. Uh, this is John 2, 13 to 25. And then uh, please do keep it open as we go through. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, there are Bibles at the back. You are always welcome to go and grab one of those. Uh, but John 2, from verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making, making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So Jesus, so the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he knew himself, he himself knew what was in man. Amen. Uh, I want to ask you uh, to remember a time that you've probably been trying to forget. I want you to remember uh, some of what it was like two and a half years ago. Uh, that time when we first went into lockdown. Uh, for some, that was a time when they had more time on their hands than ever before. Uh, those without some jobs or without small children. Uh, I was one of those people with a bit more time. Uh, and so I, like many others, discovered a new interest. I know people might have taken up new hobbies, going on walks or painting or, or any of those sorts of things. I discovered that I really enjoy watching Homes Under the Hammer. I had never seen the show before, but quite often in the day, if I had time in the late morning, uh, I would go downstairs, um, I would join my mum, my mum would be doing classic mum things, she'd be looking on property websites, uh, she'd be nagging me about not doing enough work when I was at school, even though I finished five years before that. And then we'd get to 11.15, whatever it was, and we'd watch Homes Under the Hammer. If you've never seen it before, the premise is that somebody buys a property under auction, uh, hence Hammer. Uh, the property needs a whole bunch of work doing to it. Um, they show you before and after, and they say how much they could sell on the property for or rent out the property. Uh, the, the, the process they go through, uh, somebody who buys the property, is kind of a threefold process, at least from my estimation. First, what they have to do is they have to do an assessment. They go to the property, they assess the damage, what needs to be done. The second is they go through that process of removing the damage, knocking through a wall or doing whatever they have to do. And the third is that they rebuild or remake the place better than it was before. They assess the damage, they remove the damage, and they remake the place better than before. As we approach this passage of Jesus cleansing the temple, I think we see Jesus go through that same process. He turns up, he assesses the damage, what has gone wrong in the temple. He then removes that damage and then he promises to remake it better than it was before. Now, so look with me as he assesses the damage. Look, at me, look with me at verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. I want to, to pause there. There is more on assessing the damage. The first thing we need to see is that Jesus does this assessment in person. He, God, 
had always been able to see exactly what was going on in the temple. He had always been able to see that there was a problem. He had a bird's eye view over all creation, able to see more clearly than any of us the sin and the wickedness that might have been going on. But he didn't just look from afar. Because of his care for the world and the people that he had made, he came to do that assessment in person. All the way from the riches and the majesty of heaven to the poverty of the earth, he came to see what was going on. Uh, as we see in verse 14, in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And so people uh, in the temple were selling oxen, sheep do- and sheep and doves and there were money changers sitting there. Uh, that wouldn't have been that foreign a concept uh, to them. In order for them to give their sacrifices at the temple, they needed to offer sacrifices in certain animals. They also had to pay what was a temple tax which would use a special coin. But particularly at the Passover, people would come to worship at the temple from afar. Uh, they'd come with all their uh, different coins, and so they would need to change their coins in order to pay the temple tax. Also, as they came from afar, nobody wants to trek for a few days bringing a whole cartel of animals with you. And so what had been the, the principle before this was that uh, those who were selling the animals, those who were the money changers, sat out on the Mount of Olives. And that was about three kilometers from the temple. And you would go there as you arrived in Jerusalem, you'd buy the animals that you needed, you'd change your money, and then you'd journey onto the temple to offer your sacrifices to God. But at this point in history, that's not the picture we see. The temple, rather than just being known as a place of worship, has become, as Jesus uh, calls it, a a house of trade or a marketplace. Uh, I've got a picture of what the temple uh, would have looked like in those days to kind of help us uh, picture this in our minds a little better. Uh, You do not need to be able to read the words, do not worry. Um, But this is the temple. There's a a, a key here. That is the football field, it says, uh, and that is the size of the temple. So it's a huge, uh, big structure. Uh, The outer bit, once you get uh, through the walls, uh, is called the Gentiles' Courtyard. It makes up the majority of the temple. And all this trade that was going on would have been happening there. Uh, Then within the temple you have what is called the Inner Temple. And Gentiles were not allowed to enter the Inner Temple. They were excluded from that. As you went into the Inner Temple, uh, you had to be a Jew. But then if you were a woman... Uh, you would be blocked out at a certain point. You'd also be blocked out if you were a leper. Uh, Then at some stage, ordinary men would be kept out and only priests, and then high priests get further and further in. It was a system all the way through of levels of exclusion. And it becomes even more exclusionary when that whole Gentile's courtyard is taken up by animals. That if a Gentile had wanted Uh, for whatever reason to come and worship God, all they would have heard around them is the sound of animals and trade going on. A place designed to worship God become a marketplace. Like us going to town uh, on a Saturday and trying to worship there in the middle of a busy street. Uh, We can uh, get rid of the picture. Jesus comes with anger, assessing the damage, seeing that his place of worship has become a house of trade. And what's more, aside from that, uh, another picture we see of what's actually going on is that the people doing the money changing and selling the animals were extorting the people for profits. It's less clear in the way John tells the story, but in the other gospel writers, it's clear that there's extortion going on. And if you were to read some of the uh, Jewish literature at the time, because you had far too much time on your hands, you'd see that uh, people were complaining regularly that the priests from the family of Annas, who were the priests at the time, were charging extortionate prices that left so many, the poor and the widows, unable to offer the sacrifices that they had been called to offer. People, the priests in charge, were using God for their own profit and their own gain. And so it makes sense to us as we see Jesus' reaction. It makes sense to us that he reacts so severely because the damage is so great. A place of worship become a house of trade. 
poor people and Gentiles excluded. I want to offer us a slight note of caution as we may seek to apply this to our own situation. We can't just uh, apply everything that happened in the temple to uh, everything that happens in the church today. There's a whole lot of different things going on. But at the core of it, there is the same. It is the gathering of God's people for worship. And so we have to ponder as we read this passage, if Jesus were to walk through those doors and assess, what would he see? One question we might want to reflect on and ask ourselves as individuals and as a church is who is missing, who might be excluded this morning. Not just who is missing and uh, and who may may be away on holiday or we haven't seen for a couple of weeks. But who is never here? What groups or what people represented in Kintor and around about us would never dream of setting foot in a church? And now I truly believe if anybody, uh, literally anybody was to walk in, they would receive a warm welcome. And we have on websites and on banners, we have things that say you are welcome here, whoever you are. But I know that there are thousands of people outside those doors who wouldn't dream of coming in. And we might not think we're excluding them. But have we just even excluded them by not giving them the proper invites? Have we excluded people ourselves by not inviting them to come and worship God with us? The other question we might be called to ask ourselves is, are we tempted to use God for our own gain like the priests did? And now to use God for profit, I think uh, as part of the the Protestant church, we are pretty aware of the the dangers of that. Now we look back on the Reformation, we see the indulgences that were being sold by the Catholic church, something you could buy to get less time in purgatory and get to heaven a little faster. We react to that and say, no, you, you can't do that. But as we look across the church circles we might find ourselves in, we see stories, horrific stories of people using God for their own gain. Just a few weeks ago, a report was released uh, by the Southern Baptist Convention in the States, detailing decades of sexual abuse and the mishandling of it. There are stories across the evangelical uh, world in the UK of abuse going on. Remember uh, recently uh, the stories of Rabbi Zacharias coming out. We've got to keep on guard and not get complacent, but to ask ourselves, how are we potentially tempted to use God for our own gain? And the other question we might want to ask ourselves. Okay, we've asked ourselves if Jesus was to come through these doors and assess our church, But if we were to ask Jesus to assess our hearts, what would he see then? I'd imagine for many of us, he would see our heart that 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 is sometimes pointed so directly and squarely at Jesus. But I expect he'd also see our heart that is so prone to wonder, to love so many other things before loving Jesus. A heart that is set on loving ourselves before loving him. I would encourage you, later, whenever, to ponder over that question, to allow Christ to really assess us as a church and in our own hearts. That second stage Jesus goes through is to remove the damage. So from verse 15, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Uh, Jesus uh, makes up his whip, uh, goes around the Gentiles' courtyards and drives out all the animals. Now, if this place was heaving with animals, we saw how big it was on the screen. This is a pretty excessive task. Uh, If you ever uh, tried to organize any animals or anything, uh, you'll know that it is a huge amount of work to get them to do what you want them to do. And Jesus goes around all of them and drives them all out. 
to the oxen, he drives them out to the sheep, he drives them out to the pigeons, uh, he tells those to get the pigeons out of here. He turns over the tables of the money changers. As Jesus comes to cleanse the temple, to remove the damage that has been done to those who are trying to worship him, he is thorough in removing every last drop of damage. We might ask ourselves, if Jesus were to come and cleanse this city, uh, this town, this church, us, how thorough a job would he need to do and where would he start? Maybe we'd be able to to point to other uh, places or people and think, hey Jesus, if you're coming to cleanse, I know some people that could really do with it. Maybe we'd say, well Jesus, if you go to town on a Saturday night, that would be a good place for you to start. Maybe we kill ourselves and say, hey, Jesus, if you, uh, if you went to the casino, if you went to the club, you'll find a lot of sinners there. They could do with a lot of cleansing. Maybe on a Sunday morning, if you went to all the places that people are that is not a church, hey, Jesus, you could do some cleansing there. Maybe we begin to kid ourselves that because we're sitting here on a Sunday morning, we are so much holier than those who are not. And maybe even if we say, okay, yeah, Jesus, I get that you need to cleanse the church, we'd think just of the big church and we'd maybe even look at other churches and say, yeah, Jesus, you need to cleanse them, they're doing things wrong. They sing the wrong songs, they say the wrong things. Jesus, they need cleansing. And it would be so easy to never look at our own church or our own selves and just point Jesus away. When Jesus goes through his ministry, His harshest words, his biggest cleansing are for those who claim to worship him. If Jesus is coming to cleanse us, then he'll start in here. And we might say, well, well, Jesus, I I, I get that we need to be a bit better. We see a perfect God and we realize a little bit of our own sin. We might think, well, maybe I could just cleanse it myself. Maybe I could just undo enough wrongs and, uh, and I could be somebody who, who worships God without Jesus having to, to drive me out or go to so much effort to cleanse me. But in our best efforts to be pure in ourselves, all we do is we get a little bit dirtier. Paul calls even our good works polluted garments. The best that we can offer to God falls drastically short of how glorious he is. And so the Jews in the temple, the world around us, us, all in desperate need of Jesus to come and cleanse us. And as Jesus cleanses us, like driving out every single animal and turning over all the money, he does a thorough job. He takes, uh, as he goes to the cross, he takes all of our sin, every single one. And not just in taking our sin, taking that dirt away to cleanse us, but to make us new again by giving us his righteousness. That we could enter the temple, that we could enter church, that we could enter God's presence. Because we come to him as clean people washed in his blood and made new. Given the chance to worship him by the grace that he has given us. And in Jesus cleansing mission. He completely reverses that exclusion that was going on in the temple. And so think of the, the kind of grand picture of Jesus coming to earth, uh, coming all the way from heaven, all in that perfection. He doesn't come as he comes to earth, he doesn't come to the most powerful nation, he doesn't go uh, to the center of Rome, he doesn't even go to the leaders of Israel, he doesn't even go uh, to those who would have had good standing. He goes and is born in a a, a stable. His death was the worst death he could die. He was, as the Bible would describe, cursed as one who hangs on a tree. And if Jesus sunk to that low, then we know that all of us can be included. Because there is no lower you can go than born in a stable and cursed on a tree. And so in his death, he says to us, you, no matter if you have felt excluded by the church for your whole life or excluded from society or however you are feeling, whoever you think you are doing, you are invited to come and embrace that death that Jesus has died for you. 
To look at him on the cross and see that he is the one that has died for you. To give all your sin and your dirt that needs cleansing to Jesus. And then Jesus rebuilt the place better than it was before. Look at verses uh, 18 to 22. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. In Jesus' mission of cleansing the temple, he didn't just spruce it up with a new lick of paint, he completely destroyed it to rebuild it completely anew. But in that new building of the temple, it would be a temple that is incorruptible, that is everlasting. Not located just in one place that everyone would come to in Jerusalem, but that that new temple would be himself. It would be Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. One theologian uh, writes this, Christ is the temple and all men are commanded to come to him in order to worship and serve the one true God. That's an invitation Jesus gives himself to the uh, woman at the well in John 4. Uh, If you'd like, just turn over the page. Uh, We'll read verses 20 to 24. Uh, She says to him, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here. When the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The Samaritan woman was somebody for whom uh, her whole life she had been excluded from going to the temple to worship God. And now Jesus personally goes in person to invite her to worship him. Because it is not about the place. It is not about any offering we could bring but it is that Jesus has been offered as a sacrifice on our behalf, and so we worship Jesus our Lord in Jesus our Lord. And all of us are invited to go with him the whole way. Uh, In a few moments, uh, we're going to take communion together. And that is an invitation uh, from Jesus to, to worship him as part of that. And I want you to, uh, to picture, maybe as we do that, to picture that image of the temple again. And we see the, the system of exclusion. But rather than passing through a lot of barriers that would keep us out, could we imagine Jesus taking us through? And we think, oh, we're getting close to the center. Surely Jesus is going to drop me off here. I can't go all the way into the presence of God. Surely not I. Surely I am not good enough to go all that way. And yet Jesus brings us right in because he has given us perfect righteousness because he is the Lord standing in glory that invites us in. And in Jesus as our temple, we have a temple that will never fade away. Now this temple was destroyed uh, about 30 years after Jesus died, never to be rebuilt Any systems uh, we make or buildings we build will one day fail. But in heaven we have a king, Jesus, our temple, who will never fail, never leave us or never forsake us. And we look forward to a day when we worship him together in glory. And so I want to close with some words from Revelation 21. These are words written by the same author, pointing us towards how we will worship Jesus together. So Revelation 21, 22 to 27. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God's. 
the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring it into it, into the glory and the honour of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for that picture of a glorious day where there is no temple, but our temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, the Lamb. But as we consider ourselves now, Lord, would you assess us? Would you assess us as a church and point us towards where we need to repent? Would you assess our own hearts? Reveal to us where they are not pointing towards you. And we thank you uh, that by your death, by your son's death on the cross, you have removed our sin from us. As far as the east is from the west, so far is our sin gone from us. And that you make us new to worship your son, the living king, standing in glory. And we do long for that day. Amen.